as I mentioned, um, I have already recorded a lot of this uh, and posted it to the YouTube channel, but it makes sense to um, go through it once again here. Uh, why do we calculate size class distributions? They tell us a lot about forest stands, how they're changing, the, um, the resources that they have. It gives you a sense of how much biomass you have, how much potential generate regeneration there is, depending on the distribution of size classes. If you have all large trees or all small trees, uh, a narrow range of, of distributions, it tells you how resilient it is to disturbance. Many practical reasons for understanding how and why to calculate size class distributions. So here's an example. This is an analysis that I did. And this was asking, how does sudden oak death, this disease that I, I spend a lot of time studying, how is it changing size class distribution? Many disturbances are, have a greater impact on certain size classes. And as is common with insects and disease, lots of times they kill, disproportionately kill large trees. And this disease does the same thing. So, what you see here, this is proportion dead within size classes, one to five centimeters diameter up and uh, up to the largest size class, which was 40 to 110 centimeters. Uh, this is tan oak. Um, and what you see here is you've got 60% mortality in the invaded stands in the largest size class. And then compare that with the uninvaded stands. You know, it's like less than 1% mortality. It's not to say that there aren't dead trees and large dead trees in uninvaded stands. There are. Uh, that's a few dead trees are part of a healthy stand, but this disease is disproportionately killing large trees, and you can see that when you graph this. You can see the evidence of it. That's, that's the reason for doing it. And then down here, this is a different way of showing something similar. This is the this is the the distribution of live stems, right? So up here I did the dead stems, down here I did live stems, and then in the uninvaded stand, you can see that the relative density of the large stems is much greater than in the un, in the invaded stands. Except for these small trees, this disease tends to increase stand density, but it increases the density of trees that are in relatively small size classes. Um, it's because of the how um, stands re, uh, trees re-sprout in um, our Mediterranean environment as a response to fire. If you have an insect or pathogen that kills the above ground part, same thing happens. So anyway, this, that's why you do it, right? Um, and then how you do it is uh, I showed a set of examples here in Excel. And um, the trick here is, you know, I use the stand data. This is the data that has, um, I started with this, this, this tab here. You know, it has the, the plot, the site, and then the DBH, that's the important data here. And then I just copied it into another spreadsheet so that I could, another tab, so that I could um, put things into columns. I needed these DBHs in columns so that I could count them. So I could count them within size classes. And this is how I did that. And I go through this in the video using this command count if, and then giving it a set of conditions, less than five centimeters, less than 70 centimeters. But then if you want to know, um, if you want to know how many trees are within between a certain size class, say 60 centimeters and 70 centimeters, you need to know uh, not just how many, what I've done here is I've uh, calculated how many trees are less than 70 centimeters in diameter, how many stems, but then I've also counted how many stems are between um, uh, uh, one centimeter and 60 centimeters and then subtracted those. So anyway, there are many ways of, of doing a size class distribution analysis. This is one way, like I said, um, I, I did uh, record a video about it. And then what you end up with are, are graphs that, like, that are like this. And this is just showing the size class distribution for each of these stands. How many of you have done it before? Joe. And Joe has done it because you took silviculture, right? 
Yeah, and then uh, I think I did this maybe in 315, mensuration. Oh, in mensuration, okay, also, good. Um, it's, I, I mean, I'm convinced about it. I use it a fair amount. It's just a basic way to, under, to analyze stance and to compare them. Um, and if you have a better method than I, than I have demonstrated or you know about one or you want to devise your own, go for it, right? I'll even help you um, as best as possible. Cool. All right. Like I say, everything that, um, that, I've, that I've talked about here is also repeated on the YouTube channel. And um, it's uh, call me. Try it and then call me. All right. So um, here's what I want to do now. I'm going to um, just I wanna cover a little bit of material. Um, any questions? Uh, for what it's worth, are there, you have any questions for what it's worth? If yeah, I mean, I just posted this stuff like an hour ago. And, um, you know, um, I, under, I understand you probably haven't watched it yet. Try that. Yes, Joe. In regards to the sudden oak death, is there a notable species that's kind of filling the niche that the larger trees were? Like, is bay laurel moving in, or? Maybe. Is it's it too kind of, soon to kind of tell? It's too soon to tell. Um, in terms of uh, what you can do is there's another, there's another kind of way to analyze stance, and that's to calculate the relative dominance or the relative densities. Um, and the disease, just by killing tan oak, is shifting dominance towards bay laurel. Um, and if you know about this disease, it gets spread by bay laurel. Bay laurel it spreads the pathogen really well, but the, the disease in bay laurel is like, it's unremarkable. It's just kind of um, little spots on leaves and the effects are, are absolutely minimal. Many diseases do this, both within species and, and when they infect multiple species, they'll inf the, um, some hosts, they don't get sick. They're infected, they shed the pathogen, but they don't get sick. This is a problem with um, this SARS-like virus that we're dealing with now. Most people that get infected by it either do not get sick at all, you know, like 60% of, in of infections would be unremarkable. And that is like, as a, in an epidemiological sense, that's one of the pro most problematic things that you can have. They get infected, these individuals get infected, they spread the pathogen very uh, readily to the people who will have a more severe reaction, but they do not suffer the, the disease themselves. So in Bay Laurel, it gets infected, it just sheds pathogen, it just dumps pathogen all over the place. Um, but the effects are minimal. It's like spots. I mean, and all kinds of things cause spots on leaves in bay laurel. Uh, if you're anywhere where there's bay laurel, just go out and look at some leaves and you're going to find spots on them. You know, it's unremarkable. Um, but like I say, it's those, those infections sh shed a lot of pathogen onto tan oak, which um, the infections are lethal there. That's, um, in epidemiology, you call that uh, asymmetric impacts. And it's a real problem. It's really hard to manage, especially when both your, when your, your hosts that are really good at transmitting the pathogen, as well as your hosts that uh, develop the disease when they're common, when there's lots of both of them, it's, it's, it very quickly becomes a really, really hard problem to solve. Anyway, that's a lot of what my that's a lot of what my my work is about. But yeah, um, I uh, wrapped up last time by talking about this. This is just a um, an example showing the sensitivity of um, uh, herbaceous plants to woody plants in terms of how moist or dry a site is and the disturbance frequency. 
And this is just kind of, um, this is just making the, uh, the point that in areas that are, have higher productivity, they generally can withstand higher uh, frequencies and severities of disturbance and remain, for example, dominated by forests. So Lakeo, which is on the east coast of Puerto Rico, in, uh, gets hit by, uh, frequently gets hit by hurricanes and strong tropical storms. However, uh, so, so often there's so much damage to the forests that in some other environment that would convert it from forests into something that is dominated probably by herbaceous or maybe shrubs or so forth. Uh, but it's so productive, it's so, uh, it's so wet, it's so rich and warm that um, it is maintained by, as forests even though it's got a really high rate of disturbances. Now contrast that with, the, you know, in the deserts, you can remove all the, the long-lived perennial plants, shrubs, even cacti and stuff like that with relatively infrequent disturbance. And if you've ever been out into the desert and seen tracks of um, uh, OHV vehicles or old roads, they do not recover quickly because the, the communities just change really slow. So I just, uh, that's where we were last time. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted to set that up to ask this question about for California, you know, how resilient are our forests? You know, how resilient are they to current disturbance rates and intensities? Uh, we're encountering really big and intense fires. We've got these, this massive bark beetle outbreak that is kind of winding down, but still ongoing. We got something like sudden oak death, which has killed about 50 million trees, probably more. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the drought, ha a drought which will uh, certainly occur again, uh, also is really damaging to our forests. How resilient are our forests? The honest answer is we don't know, um, but forests are changing in response to drought and changes in fire regime, the you know, inter in, uh, disturbance regimes. We can see from our data that the combination particularly of fire suppression and occasional large massive fires is shifting lots of our conifer communities towards a dominance of fir. And fir is fire sensitive, but um, oftentimes can outcompete the species that are more fire resilient in certain conditions. So fire suppression is, is increasing fir density and we've also seen an increase in oak density overall. Um, and then, of course, this increase in fire and insect mortality is ongoing in, in California forests. And we don't really know all of the implications of that. Okay. This, um, what's going to happen for the last bit of class, I'm going to use last week's reading and this week's reading. Um, I'm going to go back and forth between these two things because they're both rich in ideas and information that's relevant to us as we try to wrap up what we've covered in this class and make, um, make sense of it in some sort of kind of holistic way. Uh, these guys go through uh, systems thinking, um, thinking about these kinds of feedbacks that natural ecosystems um, have and uh, some of the other, their other uh, characteristics. Uh, negative feedbacks, which sound like a bad thing, these are um, these tend to dampen cycles and end up stabilizing ecosystems. So we saw this in the Lotka Volterra dynamics when you have um, strong intra-specific competition. It's a kind of internal negative feedback, and it has a stabilizing effect on on communities. It means that one plant or you know animal is unlikely to have uh, a really huge advantage and then overwhelm and extirpate some other uh, species. It has the effect of creating stability and creating coexistence. Uh, positive effects tend to amplify cycles and very much can be destabilizing. A good example of a positive feedback is the one I was talking about, about bay laurel. Bay laurel doesn't suffer mortality from Phytophthora morum, Mortality of tan oak seems to be increasing the abundance of bay laurel 
that should have a positive reinforcement on populations of the pathogen, which should result in more mortality and less stability of our coastal forests. That's a potential long-term problem associated with this disease. Um, and we've talked about some aspects of this, nonlinear relationships like exponential growth and even logistic growth. Um, they make things harder to predict. They are a characteristic of ecological communities. It doesn't matter what one you're talking about. Um, along with this are uh, the kinds of many different interactions. Multidimensionality is just, it's a, it's a characteristic of ecological systems that can be really challenging to deal with. Um, the other thing that they talk about is this uh, um, uh, example of emergence, and this is some characteristic or behavior or system that emerges because of the, um, the very specific characteristics that it has. So like island biogeography is a, a emergent property of um, the distribution of organisms and their relative likelihood to go extinct in isolation. Um, island biogeography isn't uh, a good theory because we named it such. It works because it has these um, easy to understand characteristics that limit populations and the, the patterns emerge because of differences in island size and island distribution. And then of course, and this is probably the good news, is that living systems are adaptive. Species change. Uh, the systems are in a constant state of change, uh, both evolutionarily and in all other aspects of their ecology. They are constantly shifting in terms of species abundance, the size of individual trees, the distribution of individual trees, all of these things are kind of ongoing all at once. Adaptability is one of the best resources that we have for maintaining our systems. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just something that, that can really, really help us uh, as we, as we kind of confront the, the really problematic aspects of um, how we sustain our, our, our forests. Okay, and um, I, uh, I always like to think of silviculture as uh, an applied forest succession. Silviculture is the, the, as a science, it is the art and science of growing trees. So the word sounds like agriculture. It is the same roots. It's really about how do you grow trees? How do you grow and develop woody plant communities? Um, and uh, it's a process that um, where there are where ecological relationships will drive this, um, the dynamics of stands, their distribution of sizes and so forth, but it can be easily manipulated also with planting, removal of individual trees, things like herbicide application to get rid of certain species. Um, yeah, there's a lots of different ways to do it. And um, each of those actions that we might take as a manager can help us with the big problems we're trying to solve. Production of timber, uh, reduction of fuels, um, maintenance of, of uh, wildlife habitat, so on and so forth. Um, it's kind of interesting about silviculture. It's, it's, um, it's one of the few areas in ecology where we have, um, we have theories that give us good, accurate, and consistent predictions about how systems change. Um, even age stand development is pretty well tested uh, in situations where you can do clear cutting, clear cutting of conifers. We tend to see some common patterns in stand development. You have regeneration gets established. Um, in these conditions, light is not limiting. Water and nutrients might be limiting, but in general, um, you light is not. Once the stands get to a certain density, you start to have uh, more competition and more um, mortality. That mortality in turn starts to open up light resources in the understory. So actually after a, some period of time and lots of conifer stands, this will be 40 years or so, and 
this model was kind of developed for northern conifer forests, you know, the um, stands that would be good representations here would be northern New England, upper Midwest, um, Germany, lots of Scandinavia and Russia, um, where fire isn't as big of an issue. But once the stands get old enough and you get some overstory mortality, you can start to get regeneration in the understory. This is a really helpful thing to know about because if you're trying to manage the stand for timber, trying to get timber out of it, this is probably when you're gonna go back and, and cut again. Oftentimes you maximize timber right here. Um, and if you let things go, then you get even more complex um, stand conditions, uh, old growth type conditions, which, um, and if you haven't been in a lot of old growth stands, we don't have that much left, but old growth is not monolithic. It's really heterogeneous. Um, there's certainly, uh, typically old growth stands will have some really awesome large trees, but oftentimes they are just, they're just very, like I say, they're very heterogeneous. It'll be some large trees, it'll be small trees, it'll be trees in all different size classes, and there will be dead trees. Dead trees are uh, really an important characteristic of old growth stands. So this kind of, um, this model, it, it, it works. It works. It is really helpful when you are managing tim stands for timber. So if you want to go into the Pacific Northwest and work in forestry, this is something that's really worth your time to study further. This is how you grow Douglas fir efficiency, efficiently and um, you know, can support local mills. A very practical thing. Douglas fir is a really great resource. And those mills up in the Pacific Northwest are important for a lot of communities. So you know, it's, there's a lot of good that comes out of this science. Likewise, in the Southeast, where uh, you, know, you have lots and lots of the economy of states like uh, Georgia, lots, some of Florida's economy, um, Alabama, South Carolina, loblolly pine. This uh, pine that dominates in really like pretty meh soils of the southeast can be grown fast and it supports a lot of, a lot of local economy. And it's wood, you know, it's like you can do all kinds of things with it. You can build structures with it, you can turn it into, um, pellets for efficient, you know, efficient heating systems. Um, yeah, it's good. Anyway, like I say, this model, it definitely works. You can grow a lot of timber quickly, and uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on it, research on it, and um, some people get bored with it because it's, you know, it's all about timber production. I get that, um, but I, I, I respect it. Okay. And I've addressed this a little bit, but you know, just um, I just want to point out again that um, single age stands have predictable patterns, and that's great. Uh, it does have this problem that it tends to create stands with a narrow size class distribution. And in the data that we've been working with for this class, you're going to see particularly two stands that really stand out for having narrow size class distributions. Um, Montana to Oro in particular because it's a plantation. Plantations are, are the kind of the most problematic in this way and this this can be problematic um, in the sense that a narrow size class distribution typically results in lower resilience of the stands and depending on what you're doing depending on what you were trying to do that could be a problem. It all depends on you and what you want, what you're trying to achieve as a manager. Okay, so let me just show you some examples here of where this works and it works well. This is in the north of Vietnam near Hanoi. Uh, I was there three years ago for a plant patho forest pathology conference. We had it. it was really great. I, I was like, Vietnam, is that the place we should have this conference? But I really learned a lot there. It was great. This is eucalyptus, which um, in the tropics, you can grow eucalyptus really fast, um, really efficiently. Uh, they run their mills off of it. 
um, it's it it works right it's a silvicultural system that works they grow all the uh seedlings from tissue culture this is the facility where they do that this is growing in in a media it's just like in a um auger like i would grow bacteria or fungi in. um these individual uh seedlings these uh, sprouts get planted and they, they do this because they can control the genetic uh stock in a very very precise way they know exactly what they're getting here these all get planted out in these little bags, and then they get planted out in the field, and they grow only for a few years, and they get to these pole-sized timber like this. And then that is, uh, this is in, at, at a mill, and they're gonna grind it up and make paper out of it. There's some problems with this. It's really intensive. Um, and in a top-down government like Vietnam, the, the government has just decided that the, that the local economy is going to support uh, the mill, and that means that uh, in a lot of areas, they're they're growing eucalyptus rather than other staples. Um, I don't think they converted their rice uh, growing areas to eucalyptus, but you know, pretty low diversity of the economy, and a little concerned about that. Um, this has been working for the last few decades, but you can see the plant pathogens building up in these systems also, which happens in monocultures. You know, there's some concern there. Uh, I have some concerns about how stable it will be over the long term, right? But at least for now, it's working in a lot of systems. Um, that's also the case. Uh, this is an example of this kind of silviculture from the Northeast. And I know that I've shown these photos a lot because it's my own experience and I've been there. Um, this is Northern conifer forests and what's going on here you've got an unharvested stand in the back it's got minimal disturbance during the historical period like it had a little bit of harvesting i think the i think the brits had gone in there and taken all the big trees for masts that was a thing to do right as uh, as um, britain started to uh, colonize the northeast one of the first things they did was go into the forests of the east coast and remove the trees that were the, uh, the, made the best masts for the ships. Um, and in fact, in parts of Maine, you can go out into these forests and occasionally, they're very rare, but occasionally there are trees that are stamped with a royal seal. And those were, you know, those were trees that were identified as being uh, belonging to the crown. And they were the trees that were, uh, that were you know, identified as making the making the best masts. So there was that. Um, but then uh, after that, you know, I mean, they basically got all that, all those trees out of the Northeast in the first, you know, in the first, I don't know, less than 100 years of colonization. And then more recently, in the last 100 years, we have these intense silvicultural systems. <coughs> this supports pa local paper mills. Um, this area has been clear cut and then treated with herbicides to uh, get rid of all the broadleaf species. So they're growing um, fir and spruce here. Again, it works. It works. These trees grow pretty fast. Um, they, they're very efficient. The, the systems up there are very efficient at growing these trees and getting them out of the woods into the mill and maintaining um, you know, production of paper products. Um, everything from toilet paper to the uh, higher quality paper that we use for laser printing. Cool. Um, some natural systems also follow these dynamics and they're a little bit less common, but it does occur. Um, they, they will be the systems that have low diversity. And the one that comes to mind, the one that's most obvious in my mind is Bishop Pine. These are these, um, stands that they're dominated by one species they're adapted to intense fire so bishop pine which burns really hot kind of burns all at once uh kills all the overstory and then you have regeneration just all establishing from that and you can see this stem exclusion phase here i mean fire this is a point reyes uh burned really intense killed the whole overstory there's plenty of uh seed in both in the in the soil as well as in serotonous cones in the canopy, this regenerated like gangbusters. And now you're starting to see mortality in there as the trees are competing for life. 
Okay, here's just um, another kind of illustration of this. Um, I've mostly just put this in there for uh, when I upload the slides. Um, now, uh, something that gets thrown into the paper for this week is this uh, idea of climax stand conditions. And this is one of the first ideas about how, uh, first ideas about ecological succession. Um, the kind of dominant idea is that there is some ultimate stand condition that when left to its, when left alone, ecological communities will develop into this ultimate stand condition and that they are stable there. It's a very attractive idea, but it is one that is probably not true. <laughs> now, left to, their, to left to their own devices, any ecological community will tend to shift away from species, uh, dominance of species that are, say, weedy, that are good at establishing, uh, to uh, communities that are dominated by species that are better at competing for resources. However, this idea of climax conditions suggests that stands or forests will develop into some sort of condition and then they will be stable there. That that is the problem that uh, ecologists realize is probably, or that, that characteristic is probably not the most accurate description of really what happens. Um, even at these late serial stages, old growth conditions, there's still dynamics. There's still individual mortality of trees. There's still a lot of things that happen. Trees get blown down, an insect or a disease will kill a tree or more than one. Um, something will snap off. There's these communities, they, they change slow. They change over the course of our lifetimes or maybe multiple lifetimes, but they are still in flux. And recognizing that will help you put any problem that you're trying to address in perspective. Okay, so um, this is an example of that Acadian forest. I show this photo a lot because it's a good picture of it. This is a late serial condition. Uh, you might call it old growth. The trees themselves, just because of their characteristics, they don't, they never get that old. You know, the spruce would be the longest lived species here and they might live to 300 years if they're lucky, but just, just trees just don't get that old here. Um, fir just, get rots and stuff and they don't, they're just not like redwood, you know, or bristlecone pine for that matter. Here's another example, you know, old systems come in many forms and we think of old growth as being stands that have giant majestic trees that are ancient. Those exist and they're great, um, but there are many old systems that are simply stable or they're late cereal, they're they're uh, dominated by species that are good at competing and they are, um, they are stable. Um, I think that this late cereal uh, is a good description of these kinds of communities. And this is a, a Mesoamerican oak pine forest. <laughs> um, it's one that is actively managed for subsistence by the local people here. This is in Chiapas. Um, and uh, they use fire and and harvesting to uh, address, uh, to get their resource needs out of these stands. Um, they've been managed this way for quite a long time. They're, they're stable forests. They're stable and they have structure that's characteristic of, of systems that have been stable for decades or century or more. So, you know, um, yeah, late, these kind of late serial conditions that might be valuable for, especially for biodiversity conservation, are not always gonna be giant old trees. In fact, sometimes these trees, these forests can be quite old, even though they don't really look like it. And this is just, uh, you know, some more kind of, um, some more insight or some more perspective on that. Sometimes stand dynamics isn't quite the best lens to see succession, and this is a high elevation stand where you have constant, the, the competition here is probably between grasses and pines. Um, you get these kind of, you know, shifts that are hard to um, predict, 
the condition of the stands are stable. There's some management that happens up here. It's kind of messy, um, or at least it doesn't fit that single that that uh, single species, um, single cohort, even age uh, class distribution development as as neatly. Um, so just please, as you go out into the world, have an open mind about how systems work and how you might maintain them with uh, the actions that you take. Great. A few other problems I want to cover here real quick and then we'll end it. So one of the, um, one of the sort of tenets that we start with about succession is that there's some disturbance. Some disturbance happens to uh, create renewal within these systems. And disturbance is a constant, constant part of forest stands, but it is not uniform, and it's not uniform in space, and it's not uniform in intensity. You can see this with any disturbance that you look at. Fire, wind, insect outbreak, diseases, they're not, uh, they don't have the same intensity at any one location, and they don't impact any one location in the same way um, every time. So, you know, here is the needles site, and you can see this here. I mean, there's a lot of tree mortality from West, uh, Western pine beetle, but it's patchy. There are plenty of trees here that are susceptible that didn't die from the outbreak. It's not clear why from this photograph. Um, you know, but again, all the effects of the disturbance are gonna be patchy in nature. Some trees are gonna survive by chance or for other factors. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's just a fact. This, this would be the case with any kind of disturbance, including fire. Fire is also very patchy in its intensity oftentimes. Okay, and there's one thing, one thing that I wanna leave you with, because I know that you probably haven't read the paper yet. I really like this paper, by the way. It's a little longer than um, some of the other ones that we've read. Uh, and uh, it's got some big tables that I, I did read. Um, you know, some of them were more interesting to me than others. Um, some of them you can just kind of skim. But, um, you know, it's not really a data paper. It's a narrative paper. They're taking a lot of different uh, other uh, analyses and bringing it together, trying to ask, you know, how much did pre-Columbian people impact forest structure in the Northeast or in, uh, on the East, in Eastern forests? And I think they make a great case for their argument. And one of the problems that we have uh, that we, we kind of want to confront here is that there's a lore about uh, the United States and about the New World that it was an untouched virgin ecosystem. Uh, and that it would have been dominated by late serial conditions and just nature run wild, you know, or just shaped by woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. They've been extinct for a long time, but you, you know what I mean. Um, and I think that this paper does a good job of confronting that. And, um, you know, that the ideal is that when uh, European people arrived, and this is a depiction of this here, that the forests were dominated by, tended to be dominated by larger trees, late cereal conditions, this particular, rendering of, of this idea was done about 1910. So this would have been the time when this climax theory of forest succession was kind of at its most popular. Um, and uh, this was how uh, the forests were thought of. Since that time, we've developed techniques for studying forests of the past. You can actually do really great reconstruction of regional forest dominance by um, analyzing pollen, uh, pollen deposition. So bogs, ponds, lakes, they are um, a, basically a trap for pollen that's in the, that is in the local uh, airshed. And every year pollen uh, gets layered into annual layers of sediments in, uh, like I say, in these bogs and lakes, uh, bogs, lakes, and ponds, and so forth. And then by um, coring these sediments and then carefully going through, and I mean carefully like millimeter by millimeter, 
you know, micron by micron, slicing out these sediments and then extracting the pollen and then actually counting the, the abundances of pollen. Uh, you, can, you can see, once you're, if you're trained to do this, you can, you can distinguish spruce pollen, oak pollen, hickory pollen, maple, uh, you know, all of the Eastern species just by sight. I mean, it takes some training. Um, and a lot of work to do it, but you can you can actually go back and and reconstruct regional dominance of these species over thousands of years. So think about that. I mean, since the last ice age, we have a good idea of how regional forest dominance has changed, um, and we can link that to changes in the climate as well, because we have those records um, from stable isotopes. So we, we actually know a lot about how, um, especially in the East Coast, the, there's lots of ponds and bogs and, and those kinds of things. And like I say, they're just like a, they're like a natural record of, um, of forest change in the region. We have less of it on the West Coast, which is unfortunate because we would benefit from the same kind of reconstructions here. But um, uh, that's, that's, how it, that's just how it, uh, that's the nature of the beast. Um, Anyway, that we have these records and we can, uh, we can reconstruct the dynamics of regional forests since the last glacial maximum. Um, longer, if you're lucky enough to find sediments that have survived being scoured out by glaciers. Uh, but anyway, it's pretty cool. It's, it's really interesting. Um, what, what we encountered, um, what Europeans encountered in, when they arrived in the New World, um, was probably not what is depicted here. And we'll go through that next time um, in terms of what, why it was, how it was different and why. But I'll give you some time to um, get through that paper. So anyway, I think that's enough for today. Um, if you got any, uh, like I say, the um, guidance is posted. Um, I, I anticipate some um, challenges with um, doing that, 